Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. And uh, in this episode, this is part three of a three-part series on the Israelites in Egypt. We've been talking with uh, my colleague, Scott Lancer, who is also the co-host of this program and the director of ABR, along with director of research, Dr. Bryant Wood. And uh, we've been discussing this immense amount of archaeological evidence that really fits well with the biblical account of Genesis talking about the Israelites in Egypt. Now, Bryant, we, where we picked up off on our last episode was uh, basically the death of Jacob uh, in a, in a uh, caravan that went into uh, Canaan to Shechem with Joseph and an expedition. But let's talk about, um, you know, the biblical text doesn't demand that the Israelites were oppressed for the entire period. They sojourned for 430 years, but they weren't oppressed. We see evidence in the archaeology of an intervening period of some prosperity. Yes. Could you share with the audience about that? Yes. Please. In an earlier uh, segment, we talked about the little village where Jacob and the family settled down, the kind of small little houses. And yes. one particular uh, house uh, appeared to be more important than the others, four-room house and the, a monumental tomb. Well, the next phase uh, is amazing. <laughs> because <clears throat> it's totally different. On top of that, the archaeologists found a very large, what they call a mansion. Mm -hmm. It's an Egyptianized palace, actually, but it's not a palace, but it's a huge structure. So you would think, oh, some new people came along, mm -hmm. but they're not new people. It's the same people because, number one, they continued to use the cemetery. And uh -huh. number two, that four-room house that we talked about occupied a very special place in this mansion. They, there was two uh, parallel or kind of adjoining bedrooms, bedroom suites. Okay. We're talking about a palace now. And right between the two of them, kind of in the middle of this whole big structure, they didn't even get to the outer limits of it, but it's enormous palace structure. Right in the middle, right between the two bedrooms, they, they built the, this mansion right on top of the location of the four-room house. And I've outlined it in red on the map of this mansion. Yes. And you can see the stratigraphic importance of it. And uh, certainly, whoever built this mansion, whoever lived in it, is a continuity from that poor little uh, village that was there at the beginning. At the beginning. And yeah. uh, our research, and again, Doug Petrovich uh, is very uh, uh, important in this uh, research, uh, has determined that it appears that the mansion was occupied by Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Manasseh. Uh, Doug okay. has uh, identified the names of these uh, individuals in the Egyptian uh, text that we have. Uh, and it appears that Joseph set up his two sons to be in charge of this uh, town of Ramses, which was involved in many, many commercial operations, and they were very, very wealthy. Uh, right. And so it appears that the Israelites were running a big operation here out of Ramses, and that they were wealthy individuals, and uh, the palace was Ephraim and Manasseh, and with the other buildings uh, in the town were very uh, well off as well. And uh, it appears that the, until the time of the oppression, the Israelites did very well in Egypt. Very well. Well, we're not giving this period justice <laughs> from the archaeological standpoint, but we do need to move ahead to the oppression, and Scott is going to take us there. So let's yeah. go ahead with that, Yeah, Scott. we're going to move ahead in time here. Um, uh, we read in Exodus 1 that a pharaoh arose in Egypt who did not know, did not know Joseph. Mm -hmm. And that's an, uh, an important statement. Um, let's just talk a little bit about that uh, circumstance and that time period. Okay. Well, again, uh, I, I mentioned this uh, long time period of kind of silence uh, after the death of uh, Joseph at the end of Genesis till we pick up the account in Exodus chapter 1 
which is the events at the end of their sojourn leading up to the Exodus. And so we have mention here of this Pharaoh who did not know anything about Joseph. And in the meantime, a group of people had taken over Egypt They're called the Hyksos. They ruled for 106 or 108 years, something like that, uh, from Canaan, Canaanites. Uh, and the Egyptians uh, chafed under the rule of these foreigners. <laughs> it's a great word. <laughs> for, for, you know, decades. And finally, uh, they were able to get their act together, so to speak, militarily and overthrow these Hyksos and, and drive them out. And so the uh, first new pharaoh coming on the scene was Akmos. And it appears he is the pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And uh, native Egyptian, but you know, didn't know who this guy Joseph was. Mm -hmm. But here he's got all these uh, Israelites living in the town of Ramses. I should mention that Ramses uh, was earlier Avaris, the Hyksos capital. So Akmos drove them out uh, of their capital. And took over. And took over, and he actually settled there, built palaces there, and uh, was one of the areas where he ruled from. But he, he had no knowledge of uh, Joseph. Yes. Now I'm gonna give you just one minute, Brian, for this, for this. I'm gonna give you the question, then you got one minute. Um, so the biblical text also says that the, Isra the Egypt Egyptians were afraid that the Israelites uh, were growing in size and that they were going to join with their enemies. Go ahead and comment on that. Yes. Growing in size, we have archaeological evidence that this little group that came in under Jacob uh, grew enormously during uh, the years that they lived there in Ramses. And then... Uh, uh, we have this Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, and, and he's afraid the Israelites will join forces with their enemies, who were the Hyksos. Fits perfectly. Semites from Canaan. Yeah. yeah. And again, overthrow the native Egyptian ruler. They didn't yeah. want that to happen. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, I mean, it fits, fits right in with the biblical account, because, because if you're talking about the Israelites, well, what enemies? Uh, uh, Nubians? <laughs> Uh, Syrians? No, they live in the land. Well, who's in the land? The Hyksos are in the land. They've right. already come into the land and right. occupied it. So it would be easy for them to team up with them sure. and try to overthrow Egypt. Sure. So it makes, it makes perfect sense. Well, we're going we're gonna to leave this segment with that thought about uh, the context as we're entering into the book of Exodus. And we'll be right back after this message. Please don't go away. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host Henry Smith and I'm here today with my co-host Scott Lancer and Dr. Bryant Wood and we're talking about the Israelites in Egypt. In our last segment we left off with the beginning of the oppression under the Hyksos rule and particularly uh, a pharaoh named Achmos. And uh, Scott is now going to pick us up here in this context as far as the archaeological evidence goes. So go ahead Scott, please. Very good, Very good Henry. Uh, Bryant, the, the Bible indicates that Pharaoh lived in, uh, at Ramses and uh, that it was near the Nile. Uh, what kinds of archaeological evidence do we have for those biblical descriptions? Mm. Well, this uh, expedition to Tel el Daba that we've been talking about has produced an enormous amount of evidence mm. from the time period of the Exodus, the time of Moses, and so on. You know, one of the arguments that used to be used against the biblical account is, well, uh, the Pharaoh did not rule at Ramses. The Bible has got it all wrong here. 
No, no. The pharaoh ruled at Memphis, down a little bit south of modern-day Cairo. The Bible's way off base. Well, archaeology has shown the Bible's got it right on the money. Now, it talks in the Bible about being close to the Nile. Well, at Tel El Dalba, you don't see the Nile River today, but it once flowed there. And uh, the uh, scholars working there have kind of traced the uh, former uh, Nile uh, bed of the river. Uh, it, the Nile River keeps moving westward through time. Okay. Uh, and, and there's different branches, of course, out there in that delta area. And a, a branch of the Nile fl flowed right past the site of Ramses in the days of uh, Joseph and, and, and Moses. And so uh, we have, uh, I think it's uh, on our screen now, a uh, sort of a, a plan, a map of the area showing where the Nile River once flowed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we have a good idea now of the situation there at Ramses in the time of Moses. And uh, the archeologists have excavated a royal precinct there. Mm -hmm. And not just one palace or two palaces, but three palaces, all from the time of Moses. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the Pharaoh did rule there. Why did he rule there? Because it was the jumping off point for the campaigns into Canaan, into Syria. Mm -hmm. And so it was a beehive of activity. It was a commercial center to begin with but also it was a military center where the army outfitted itself. They got their supplies together, their weapons together, everything that they needed to carry on a campaign. And then, then they launched out from Ramses up into Canaan. Uh, and so uh, in the Bible, when we read about uh, Pharaoh's daughter finding Moses yes. in the ark, mm -hmm. in the uh, Nile River, it's exactly right. These palaces are right on the bank of the Nile River. Mm -hmm. Moses goes into the palace to confront Pharaoh. Yes. It's right there where the Israelites were living and where they were being oppressed at this time and were crying out to Yahweh. Yes. Uh, so everything fits exactly uh, as we read in the Bible. We have the royal residence there. He wasn't there all the time, but you know, part of the year the Pharaoh was there yes. at Ramses in those palaces. His daughter was there, who incidentally could be the famous Hatshepsut. She fits yes. perfectly chronologically. Uh, and she later became a Pharaoh herself. Yes. Uh, so th this fits perfectly. And uh, Moses being raised in the courts of Egypt, this would have been the place. And of course, he would have probably moved with the royal family when they went to Memphis and received training there. But uh, yeah. it, everything just fits perfectly. What the Bible said and what scholars said was a big, big error in the Bible. Not so. Right. It's exactly right. Another yeah. argument from silence. Yeah. Now, you mentioned <clears throat> Queen uh, Hatshepsut. And I learned that in Egypt on a tour. We went on hat, cheap suit. Oh, That's okay. <laughs> how you always remember a queen hat, cheap suit, right? So let's talk about her uh, and a couple, just a couple of the pharaohs right there because they fit. Tutmosis III, Amenhotep II, and um, hat, cheap suit. you got about two and a half minutes or oh, so wow. to cover that. We'll, we'll talk about it more in the next segment, though. Yeah. Okay. So if you could introduce that. Well, of course, uh, Moses grew up in the courts of Egypt and uh, learned all the, uh, the languages of, of Egypt and probably other languages as well. So he was being trained, being prepared by God for the great important role he would play uh, right. in the Exodus. So um, his, his stepbrother, I guess you'd call him, was Tutmosis III, who became a great, powerful uh, pharaoh. The greatest, probably, in terms yeah, of military the, conquest. The empire builder, yeah. he's called. Yeah. Yes, so this is the very uh, time period when Moses was getting his training alongside of Tutmosis III, you yeah. know, two great figures in the history of the world. Sure. Uh, and so, uh, of course, Moses got in, uh, in trouble uh, when he killed the uh, taskmaster who was abusing 
uh, his people, the, the Israelite people, the Hebrews, and so he ended up fleeing uh, from Egypt and uh, going to Midian and uh, hiding out there for some 40 years until God uh, called him back. Uh, in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the meantime, we read in the Bible that uh, those who had been uh, opposing Moses or were out to kill Moses, and certainly Moses III would have been out to, to get Moses, they had died now, and so he could go back, and God called them to go back and uh, free his people. And so that would have been now the next Pharaoh, Amenhotep II. And uh, so Tutmosis III, Pharaoh of the Oppression, and uh, Amenhotep, the uh, Pharaoh of the Exodus. Yes, so it fits nicely in that context. So um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Pharaoh Tutmosis III, one, one comment we'll leave before we go to break uh, is one of the requirements is that the Pharaoh is alive when Moses flees. He's gone for 40 years. So the, and now he's finally died. Thomas III ruled for 54 years. So that fits. You've got to have a Pharaoh that was on the throne for more than 40 years. Right. And he fits it. So yeah. that's a perfect way to end this segment. Uh, folks, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We'll be entering our last segment to talk about the Israelites in Egypt. And we'll be back in just a few moments. Please don't go away. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host Henry Smith, and uh, we're here today with my co-host Scott Lancer, Dr. Bryant Wood. We're talking about the amazing archaeological evidence connected to the events in Genesis uh, and the Israelites in Egypt during the sojourn and then leading up to the Exodus. So, uh, Scott, we were talking about, sort of talking about the pharaohs of this time period, but you have a specific question you want to ask Bryant here yes. about, uh, about one of those pharaohs. Yes, we had mentioned about Hatshepsut and uh, the, her importance, but there's some very, very uh, important uh, uh, observations from history regarding uh, Egyptians who were effacing her from erasing her from history. Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that, Brian. Well, she's a very interesting figure. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, we mentioned in the last episode, she became uh, Pharaoh. Uh, and she actually co uh, ruled with Thutmose the uh, III. She was his step aunt or something, I forget the relationship. But anyway, uh, they ruled together. And then uh, upon her death, Thutmose III becomes the sole pharaoh mm -hmm. and uh, becomes this great uh, military figure and a, a great leader. Uh, and there's this very peculiar thing uh, in the Egyptian records where they, for some reason, wanted to erase the memory of Hatshepsut. Uh, and uh, her name is, is chiseled out of the mm -hmm. monuments, her statues are broken. Uh, she built a beautiful mortuary temple. It's one of the highlights of a tour to Egypt. It's just a gorgeous uh, structure. Uh, but w why did this happen? And it's been sort of a mystery. And uh, perhaps, again, we're kind of speculating, but you know, there, nobody has a, has a good answer for it. It may be her connection to Moses mm. and the Exodus. You know, she raised Moses, of course. She took him out of the Nile, brought him into the palace, became, her, became his stepmother, I guess you could say. Yes. And uh, then he became the guy 
responsible for the plagues and uh, all the bad things that happened <laughs> yeah. uh, at the time yeah. of the Exodus. And so, of course, she had been dead quite some time at the time of the Exodus, but maybe it's a backlash uh, after the Exodus mm -hmm. that they want to just eliminate this bad person who brought this Moses into Egypt there, you know. Yeah. Yep. raised him uh, up as a great leader, whatever. So, so the biblical text says that it was Pharaoh's daughter <laughs> that took Moses out of the water. Yeah, not and named. She, yeah. Not named, right? So that she fits the biographical and the chronological mm -hmm. sort of yes. context. She was She's a princess. A good can a candidate. Princess. If you could talk briefly about the significance mm -hmm. of, of removing her name, who mm -hmm. cares? Mm -hmm. But theologically speaking, in Egyptian thinking, talk about that well, because it's yes, pretty important. Uh, you had to have your name on your tomb or uh, on your burial uh, casket or whatever uh, to enter into the afterlife. This was very important. You had to have that name. And if the name is erased and gone and you don't have a name, you're not going to make it in the afterlife. So, so you're, you're in, a, in effect, in a way, we might find the analogy here in, in Scripture, you know, it, it finding your name written in, in the, the book life. of life. <laughs> and in the case uh -huh. of Hatshepsut, maybe they were trying to erase her name mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. from the afterlife. Is that is that the sort of the implication? Uh, I mean, yeah, something like that. out of I mean, Egyptian had, theology had that great, flows. That significance. You know, the Egyptians had this idea that if it's written down, it's factual. It's it's, it's, it's historic. Uh, but if if it's not written down, it never happened. You it's know, a form of sort of a form of denial. <laughs> yeah. In a way, well, you can be, which would explain why one of the things that people always say about the Exodus. Well, how come there's no written yeah, records no of written it in the record. Egyptians' records? Yeah. Maybe maybe make a comment on of that. Of course, they're not yeah. going to record a humility, a defeat. It's not going to be found. Yeah. Their records are bragging about their accomplishments, the yeah. greatness of Pharaoh, and all of that, and so it. Writing, in a way, had a magical power for the Egyptians. Yeah. And uh, you don't write down anything that's bad. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, that makes, it makes a lot of sense. So we have, from all of this evidence, uh, not direct evidence, Joseph was here, Jacob was here, Moses was here, uh, the plagues happened the way they're described in the Bible. But what we've got is a package of everything that points in that direction, yes. wouldn't you say, from this, from these three episodes right. that we've talked yes. about? Now, the million-dollar question was, who's the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Mm -hmm. Now, you kind of teased that a little bit, Brian, <laughs> in our previous segment. Mm -hmm. But let's just talk a little bit about uh, Amenhotep II, yes. uh, and in that context, and I'll give you about a minute, minute and a half <laughs> or so to do that. So, okay, so Some, go for it. Something scholars have been working on for centuries, and I'm yeah, gonna... who is he? <laughs> well. Uh, Using the biblical chronology, of course, and lining that up with Egyptian chronology, uh, the answer would have to be uh, Amenhotep II, who took over after the death of Thutmose III. And again, uh, there's so many things from his reign that fit very nicely uh, with the biblical text. Uh, just one example is the fact that he had many campaigns into Canaan uh, in his reign. And one of the significant thing, things that he did was he brought back many captives. Now, why did he bring back so many captives? Moses III didn't bring back a lot of captives. Well, I think it's because they lost their workforce in Egypt at the Exodus. Yeah, when the Israelites yeah. all left. Right, so yeah. I think he's replacing the Israelites. And uh, he brought back tens of thousands of captives. And that was unusual. Unusual. Very unusual. Very in unusual. Egyptian records, right. Yeah. Right. And so uh, it, it fits very nicely uh, into what uh, the Bible tells us. Yeah. So in these three episodes, gentlemen, we've covered 430 years of history, and, and, <laughs> which is very difficult to do. Yeah. But I think we've shown uh, a weaving together of archaeological evidence, the right context, uh, Asiatics from Cayman, um, circumstances that fit with the biblical descriptions. Egyptian uh, palaces that we didn't know were there that, until they were excavated. Right, where well, yeah. they said that the, the pharaoh wasn't there in, in, the, in the Nile Delta. We have a, a pharaoh we can identify of the oppression 
and of the Exodus. We have Pharaoh's daughter, possibly, with Hatshepsut. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of stuff. And folks, with that, we'd like to leave you with the encouragement that you can trust the biblical accounts, that when God has spoken, uh, he has spoken accurately, both theologically and historically. And if you can trust the events in the Old Testament, you certainly can trust the ones in the new, culminating in the person of Jesus. We thank you for joining us for these three episodes. Thank you.